Meet Julian Vogt, a mere 95, almost 96 years old, when I took these pictures in 1977. Julian usually snowboards, but on this day, Julian felt that since snowboarders spend a lot of time on their butts, the snow was too hard for him to ride a snowboard. Julian skied since he was six, but he first tried snowboarding for a couple of times when he was 78 and then got serious at 82. Julian says skiing and snowboarding at 95 isn't a problem for him, but sometimes it seems it is for other people. I should act my age, uh, but I tell them uh, <laughs> you can ski at any age. You just People think you have to go fast to do certain things. You don't have to go fast at all to ski. You can go as <laughs> slowly as you want and stop any time. And uh, that's one of the first things you learn in skiing is to ski safely and, and that means not going faster than being in control. So uh, it's, uh, a, I know some people right now that have a hard time walking but they ski better than, they ski better than they walk actually. So uh, as long as I can walk maybe I'll be able to ski. And, I'd board maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, people that don't ski, they think it's so hard because of all of the publicity that the racers get and the, the freestyle free skiers, and the same with the board. It's all, it's all in the air. And so people have a, a, an idea that uh, it's also difficult. It's not difficult unless you make it difficult. <laughs> you can go as slow as you want. You can go on the flatland uh, with a gentle slope and it, it's, it's just as easy as walking. It's easier than walking because you slide down the hill. Julian not only skis, he swims several times a week year-round at the Glenwood Hot Springs Pool, which happens to be near his home. I'm just, the uh, main thing is just to have fun in the water and uh, get some good exercise for my body and my lungs. But he just doesn't limit his physical activities to skiing and swimming. When I'm not skiing, I, I like to rollerblade and uh, I don't do much hiking anymore. We used to do a lot of hiking, but I like to rollerblade and I bought a bike after 56 years of being off a bike while uh, I don't do too well on that. I don't go very far on that. And, and I just bought a pair of uh, figure skates and uh, it's, it's something like uh, it's something like rollerblading. I, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a little different. So once in a while I like to go uh, ice skating, especially if I can go outside on a lake. I, li I like outside sports better than inside sports. I produce documentaries and everything you've seen so far was shot in 1977 for one I'm working on called Killing Our Parents with Kindness, Permission Not to Be Old. And I wanted to have pictures of Julian skiing since he turned 100, but I have a problem. Shooting video of Julian Vogt was kind of a challenge for me because I'm blind. Now I'm not totally blind. I am in this eye. This uh, eye has been removed and it's a plastic prosthetic eye that I use now. I have no vision through it. Until two years ago I could see pretty well out of my left eye. I could drive and I could function normally. However, after some surgery which was supposed to improve my vision, my vision got considerably worse and since then I've been bordering between being legally blind and just better than legally blind. I had to walk with a white cane and it became very hard to read and use a computer. After three more surgeries including a partial cornea transplant I was able to walk without a white cane after I got these glasses. Most people can see pretty well when their computer screen set the way it normally is set. I can't. I have to enlarge it at least this much just to be able to read it, but it's not comfortable. For me to make it comfortable, I have to make it even a little bit bigger. And my vision fluctuates. 
So during the day, I might even have to make the screen this big to be able to read it. Also, I can read, but I have to do a lot more than just pick up a newspaper to be able to do it. I have to pick up my jeweler's loop, which in addition to my glasses has two other magnifying glasses on it. And when I hold the paper this close, I'm able to see the words on it. This is a problem for not only reading newspapers, but being able to see viewfinders on cameras. That was until the week before I was supposed to shoot videos of Julian skiing. When this cute little 40 pound Pug Sharpe mix stepped on my eye while I was lying in bed. The little mother not only made me easier to pick out in a crowd, he took out the epidermis, which is the top layer of my cornea, which, even though it has healed, has reduced my vision from 2070 to between 2150 and 2250 under ideal conditions in the doctor's office. But functionally, under normal conditions, I see much worse. I have to walk with my white cane again, and I'm very sensitive to light. It's a big problem when I'm outside, and even a bigger problem when I'm on snow, which is where I have to be when I shoot pictures of skiers. When I realized I had to shoot pictures of Julian before the snow melted, I had to find a way to adapt my camera so that I could use it. So the first thing I tried was taking one of these reusable grocery bags and removing the plastic bottoms that come in some of them, and adapt this so it would block the light that makes it hard for me to see a viewfinder. I cut the black plastic to the shape I needed and attached it to my camera using pieces of Velcro. That blocked enough light for most people so they'd be able to use the camera in bright sunlight. But when I tried to shoot pictures of Julian cross-country skiing, which is what he's doing these days, the amount of glare I was able to block from the viewfinder didn't help me at all. I couldn't even tell if the camera was on, yet if it was recording or on standby. Sometimes I got good shots because I've been shooting news for 40 years, and I know where to point the camera. But just as often, I get stuff like this. Or even worse, this when I thought the camera was on standby, and it was really shooting while I was climbing to my next shot. I even tried turning the camera off and then back on, because when it goes on, it automatically goes to standby, which helped for the next shot, but I soon got confused again. When the plastic didn't work, I went back to our stash of grocery bags and found this one, which works really well. It happens to be black, and it has a big piece in the bottom that's sewn into it. So I knew I could use it to cover the viewfinder and it would black out light for me. Which I also attached to the camera using Velcro. And it worked and kept all the light out. If you want to make one of these and don't have opaque enough bags, make it two bags thick and staple the bags together. Then cover the staples with tape so you don't get cut from the staples. I like to use black duct tape because it makes me feel more professional. With the new viewfinder cover, I could tell if the camera was turned on and my head was far enough back that I could see a big red flashing light on the back of the camera when it was recording. And even though the pictures in the viewfinder are really blurred, I could tell where people and things are so I could frame the shot. The viewfinder would have been a lot less of a problem if I had a broadcast camera with an eyepiece on the viewfinder like my standard definition one. But I'm going high def. And ski season was ending and I had to use what I could afford, which is my little consumer camera, which I will eventually use as a backup camera. To be able to do this story, I needed to be able to ski, which I do like many blind skiers with the help of a guide. They ski in front of me and I follow the orange blur on their vests. One of my best guides is a 10-year-old named Shane Burr, who you see guiding me here in a video taken by his dad, Tim. Shane also helped by repeating my questions to Julian during the interviews, because Julian lost one of his hearing aids and his insurance won't replace it for a year and a half. Shane also took some great still pictures of me interviewing Julian, which show how I have to adapt to be able to shoot. I look like I'm in contortions because most cameras are made to shoot with your right eye and I have to shoot with my left eye and I was in contortions. So 20 days before Julian's 100th and 2nd birthday, which was April 20th, and after I got my gear and gear, 
Julie and I headed back up the Sunlight Mountain Resort with Julian at the wheel for the last day of ski season. Julian, who renewed his license shortly after these pictures were taken, drives better on mountain roads than anyone I've ever ridden with. And I've lived in the mountains for 32 years. He keeps his car exactly the same distance from the shoulder of the road for the whole trip. The week before, Julian used climbing skins for climbing up the hill. That's what he's holding in his hands. You slip them over the bottom of your skis and they stop you from sliding backwards. And came from the skin of real seals. They didn't have to hurt a seal to make Julian's skins, but they did have to kill a nylon. Julian's been snowboarding for the last 20 years, but he had a little problem last year, which is why he's cross-country skiing today. Yeah, I snowboarded for 20 years and then uh I sprained my neck and uh, the doc took a picture and the number two up here was cracked. And he said if it cracks some more I wouldn't be here so <laughs> I'm sort of careful. And he said he couldn't, he didn't want to operate because uh, he'd have to go in from the back and use screws. The screws might come out and tickle the spinal cord and that would be a, that would be a, yeah. Julian says his neck still isn't exactly fixed, so he's doing what he can to compensate. Uh, well, it could be growing a little bit. I uh, I tried to join the Pilates class, and they they were afraid they might hurt. But I'm in a uh, I'm in a bar fit class over at the dance academy, and it's good for balance and posture <coughs> and uh, and strength. They do a lot of strength exercises, and I'm much stronger than I was uh, a while ago. Snowboarders spend a lot of time on their butts, which may affect other parts of their bodies. Julian's cracked necks, a result of snowboard injuries, but not a specific accident. Repetition of concussions. Uh, Dr. Miller told the football moms, if your boy has three concussions, take him off the team. And I was sitting in the front row and I thought, well, uh, <laughs> I'll be careful, but uh, I sat down some more. And when you sit down, if you're not leaning forward enough, you come back on your head and you get a concussion. And I did 20 years snowboarding and I got a lot more than three uh, concussions. So it was repetition of uh, concussions. In addition to participating in a lot of active activities, Julian, who is widowed, takes care of his big yard and garden, the laundry, shopping and cooking, and all of the other things he used to share with his wife. He's also involved in the community and writes letters to the editor. I even grabbed some pictures of him with my old cell phone last summer at Oktoberfest here in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, where we both live, dancing with younger women. But even Julian isn't active all the time. He needs to spend some time on his computer. I'm sitting at my computer and uh, I don't like to sit more than an hour. I have a lot of correspondence. I have too much correspondence and uh, I have a lot of work at my computer. I always, uh, I'm farther behind in that than in anything I do because uh, I'd rather be moving than sitting at the computer. If you sit in the rocking chair, you might as well head for the box, and by the box I mean the casket. 